back, everybody, to your favorite 420 podcast. This is your main host, Chino. It is cloudy outside here in Chicago. It is raining outside. But it is all good, ladies and gentlemen, because I'm sure wherever you're at, you'll be smoking. You got your blunt rig, your little vape pen, whatever it is. But today's special guest here we have here is Molly from Fully Baked. How's it going? Hey, Tina. Thanks for having me on. I'm super happy to be here. Um, I'm actually in Denver, Colorado, where it's also super rainy, cloudy. It's pretty miserable out. But um, yeah, I was in Chicago last week and it was so cold. The amount of times I ate shit on the ice, just the streets is is brutal. But I'm um, glad to hear it's a little warmer there, at least. Yeah, here it pretty got all cleared up and all, thankfully. But, you know, mm-hmm. it really be bipolar as fuck here in Chicago. Yeah, yeah, it really so, is. It's, uh, it's so interesting that you said that you're over there in Denver. So do you mm-hmm. stay in Denver or do you? Yeah, so so I live here in Denver. I moved here in, like, October. So um, I graduated college in May, this past May. So I knew I wanted to go somewhere different um, after school. So I went to school at the University of Maryland. So I was like, I don't really want to stay in Maryland. I'm from Philadelphia originally. And I like, I love Philadelphia, but I was like, you know, it doesn't really exert my hobbies and doesn't really allow me to kind of expand and whatnot. And, um, you know, the Pennsylvania market for cannabis is so limited. It's still only rec and I'm in the edible space and edibles aren't really legal in Pennsylvania. So um, no, they aren't really, they're not legal in Pennsylvania. So um it's super hard to be a part of that edible market and kind of work to expand that so and I love Denver I was out here last summer for an internship working for Coda which is an edible company um so I worked for them and that's how I kind of got into the corporate marijuana and the edible space all in one so and I was like there's so much to learn from this market in Colorado because it's just seen so many failures and so many successes so definitely a lot to take away from the market here and um you know I just love it here in general like I said it exerts my hobbies like after this after we hang up I'm going to Aspen for the X Games actually for the weekend oh, shit, that's what's up. yeah <laughs> yeah I know I'm super excited it's gonna be so dope so really looking forward to that and it's just like everyone here is super cool and chill and you know everyone here has been smoking since they were born so it's like mm-hmm. yeah there's Canada like there's uh consumption lounges and there's not really any legal repercussions around smoking like publicly or anything it's just so very like open over there very open like open dialogue open conversation it's not like new to anyone that you work in cannabis like usually if I'm in Illinois with fully baked which I'll get into but or I was in Philadelphia it's like oh you work in cannabis like that's crazy like I don't know here it's like you don't get that hype around it which mm-hmm. I couldn't really care less about I'm sure um, they're they're like you work in there oh like, great me too <laughs> yeah me too like everyone has some sort of connection and it's super cool because it's just like more of a culture here and a community I would say than I've experienced anywhere else so like how you were mentioning like earlier that there's a lot of like failures and success like like can you get a little deeper into that like how how is the yeah. community in Denver yeah. So, I mean, I will say, like, I think the one thing, I mean, Colorado was like the second state to legalize cannabis, I believe, after Washington. So there's definitely a lot that other states have learned from their legislation or, you know, whether it's their advertising rules. And, you know, uh, for people who maybe don't know, I specifically do marketing mm-hmm. um, and education right now for Fully Baked. So, you know, with marketing, it's super hard. Like, you know, if you're looking into getting a billboard, you got to know how many feet away it is from a school. You have to know how many feet away it is from a park. Like, there's so many things and regulations that I, I know. It, I think I believe it, uh, there's like a age restriction. I think that the yeah. people have to be like 25 and older yeah, or something like that. Yeah, That's crazy. Yeah, yeah, it's really difficult. So there's just a lot of regulations. And especially I think the one takeaway from Colorado that I think other states have learned is to not oversaturate a market. Mm-hmm. So like there's a dispensary uh, like on every block here, which is really cool, but it's like you're creating more competition within the industry and you're just allowing businesses to fail more often than not. So, um, and here I mentioned that I worked for Coda last summer. They actually filed for bankruptcy probably around a month ago now. So it's like edibles aren't doing well here because the average smoker here is so traditional in the point where they just want to smoke bud. They just want to smoke like, and also people grow here. So it's like, you know, people in the mountains, they're, they're not going to go to a dispensary and, you know, grow. It's like, and buy weed and pay the taxes and everything. So right, it's like people are going to grow just... their own shit. Yeah. and then sell it to their friends so it's like 
there's a lot happening here and it's a like, too far gone to really change so it's like people know how to grow here people have been growing forever um so it's just it's super interesting here the market is so different so how about like for like the caretakers and all like is there less of that now than over there in Denver since the yeah I don't even think caretakers really exist I can't like say for sure whether they do or not like the medical market I think is pretty like minuscule I really don't think there's even a medical market here mm -hmm. uh, I mean people would maybe be a medical patient to not pay the taxes which I totally get but I don't think their medical market's really that different from rec I know for example when I was at Coda like we could sell thousand milligram chocolate bars instead of a hundred chocolate bars like the limit you can buy mm -hmm. and you make your products is a lot higher but I think that's really the only difference but you could sell recreational products um in like the medical market which was cool um but yeah it's it's very different here and also um you know you have the the psychedelic market here too so people because that's pretty open here so people aren't really smoking as, as much weed because they know that they could also get you know similar medicinal benefits and experiences from psychedelics as well and how big is like the psychedelic industry over there in, in Denver like is it a big thing or is it still kind of a growing um I wouldn't say that it's an industry yet I think like I still have to do more research about it but last summer when I was here I met um this guy named Max and he had this uh shroom farm and he would microdose uh he would make capsules um like um he would have I, I think it was like Ecuador and penis envy was the like two different types of shrooms and he would cap he would put them in capsules and they would each be 0.1 or you could get 0.5 so it was super cool he was like super about microdosing and he learned he, he taught me so much about microdosing and it was kind of my first experience kind of dabbling with psychedelics and it was awesome um I think after I met him and he gave me and my buddy who I was living with at the time like a bunch of uh like like capsules mm -hmm. and I was taking probably 0 0.1 0 0.2 every day and every day was so much brighter. It was like the sun was right above me. I was so happy. I was so giddy about everything. Like I was just smiling ear to ear. So it was just like super cool. And I know people out here, like you can grow them too. So I think that's the legal part of it is that he has the ability to have a farm and grow them. And I know chocolate bars with like psychedelics are getting big out here. So I think it's more of like a, a freedom test thing. I think Colorado is a huge test state for these types of drugs. Like I know Marijuana was a huge test state for Colorado, and mm -hmm. I know psychedelics is now becoming that kind of new test product. So it's super interesting to see the turn and it what is, is to come. It, it very is, because like who would have imagined back then that marijuana would have been like a recreational drug, and now yeah, of, of like how even psychedelics, the like just the thought of like LSD and shrooms are becoming something that's, you know, being that like the stereotypical getting out of that stereotypical way and, and, and being more of like a medical and beneficial thing which is pretty yeah pretty dope actually um but like overall like how, how how what what is it so hard for somebody to to run a cannabis in, company in denver like since there's a lot of things already out there like uh, how can yeah. one stand out like I guess for for a consumer like or is everything now just the same for Every, everybody I haven't like felt any sort of unique experience going into any dispensary here which is a shame like mm -hmm. I was in I was in Chicago last week with Fully Baked and um I walked into Karma Club and I was like wow like this place is different this place has a vibe like that stood out to me but there's nothing really here that I'm like oh this really stood out to me like I really think dispensaries and businesses are only surviving in Colorado with their MSOs and you know they're kind of just across the country mm -hmm. um like for example WANA WANA gummies they're out of Denver so they're pretty big here but I mean if you're not like a legacy brand or like you're not um like a bigger company sourcing income from other states like I don't think you have a huge survival chance here um so, and like I said, like, it's just really like, you know, flour and, and vapes, like there's nothing, like you can get drinks here, like you can get Keef Colas and whatnot, but that's really the only drink you'll see. Mm -hmm. um, 
and that's pretty much it like the edibles are pretty small like you can get like wild and wana for example like then again it's like all msos that can survive here because they have revenue coming in from other states so it's yeah i definitely don't think there's anything that special if anything it's dispensaries that are in locations that drive in tourism like mm -hmm. for example like you know boulder's pretty touristy place like um like Aspen, where I'm going to is pretty touristy. Vale, like if your dispensaries are there, and people know that they're coming from a state that they can't get weed or they want to experience Colorado weed. Like that's something for out of staters to want to experience. Then those, you know, businesses are going to do well. But other than that, I really don't think it's it's pretty hard to to be in the market here for sure. Like I would never consider bringing fully baked to Colorado. So, <laughs> well, yeah, uh, yeah I, since you knowing the insides and like knowing how it, it since it's, it is an edible company, like it's not like a right fit for for you guys. Yeah. Makes more yeah. sense. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So, um, how, how is Fully Baked so, going so far here? Because it is yeah. a, a, a company based in Chicago, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So actually, let me talk about that. I realized I didn't even introduce myself or anything at all. So let me backtrack. <laughs> nah, I don't even, even worry about it. You all good. Yeah. Um, so my name is Molly for everyone who did it. Obviously got that maybe from the beginning. I don't even know if you stated it. Um, so I am currently the president in addition to the marketing and education manager at Fully Baked Brand. So we are, um, we are out of Chicago. We kind of built our brand out of Chicago. Um, so we primarily focus on chocolates, baked goods, and kind of nostalgic snacks. Mm -hmm. So within our product line is, um, you know, with the chocolates, it's pretty all um, first to market products. We do have the first ready-made brownie, which is super cool. So I don't know how no one's really done a brownie before, but we're doing it. I'm super pumped about it. So we do have brownies. Um, we also have lemonades and brownie mix underneath us too, which are have been the rave since we've launched those. Um, so we launched about officially two weeks ago, we were in our first dispensary. So pretty new to the market, um, which is super exciting. And obviously the edible market's super competitive. So we really wanted to make sure that, you know, our products were different. So within our chocolates, like it's really Belgium chocolate that we really focus on. And it's like flavors like caramel macchiato, creme brulee, tiramisu. We got salted caramels. We have the brownies, like I said, peanut butter cups. Um, we have little like mini cream sandwiches that are replicating Oreos and you know, other things that uh, like a nougat bite that's supposed to replicate Snickers. So mm -hmm. stuff like that, that you're already eating at the end of your night, you might as well just have it get you Infused, high. Cause like, right? why not? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, I mean, like I already down like Reese's on the reg, like they might as well be, hmm. you know, infused, like why not? Right. So um, yeah. And the lemonades are fast acting, which are super cool. And I know there's a good amount of drinks out there, but um, you know, I think the can of beverage market is going to explode, especially as a lot of kids and, you know, I think the younger generation start to kind of understand how inhibiting alcohol can be and how bad it can be for you and i think that there's a ton more people um especially with dry january we're seeing like a huge spike in people um you know making uh alcoholic alternative drinks and so i really think that category is going to explode so i'm super pumped to be part of that category um so, so although you guys are are just like like focusing on on like full on like bakes goods and all like do, do you ever think like a drink could be more than a hundred milligrams, like can um, like, or is that like just the top of of what? So yeah, so that's like the highest amount of THC you can sell within one product. Mm -hmm. So there's also restrictions for in-state um, residents and out-of-state residents coming in to purchase. So for example, like an out-of-state person, so. All of our fully baked stuff is, um, all of our fully baked products are 10 milligrams each for each chocolate each or individual thing. product. Yeah. Um, but 10 pieces within that one product. So that's a hundred milligrams total. So a person, so out of state person coming in say, you know, I'm originally from Pennsylvania. I'm coming in with a PAID. I can only buy 250 milligrams. That's only 2.5 of our product. So that's super, that amount is super limiting. So I think going forward, we're definitely looking into, um, you know, so, like, you know, sizing down and maybe making ours five milligrams. So people have the option to buy more of our product and, you know, a lemonade's a hundred, but that's a huge portion of their limit right there. So 
it really limits someone and that limit is twice the amount for a resident in Illinois so they can buy up to 500 but again that's only five products which is a good amount but you know it's still limiting at the end of the day unfortunately yeah because I think depending on everybody like how how big of a tolerance you have I'm, yeah I'm guessing, like yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it depends on the tolerance. Like I was, um, I was in mission last week running like an education thing. And, you know, some of the bud tenders were like, I would down your lemonade. And I was like, are you saying you would down a hundred milligrams? Cause to me, that's a lot. Like I would never down a hundred milligrams personally. Well, well, well one is, is your top, you have, you think you have a high tolerance? I know I don't have a high tolerance. Okay. So I could definitely go into my cannabis use history, but <laughs> I definitely now today on January 26, 2024, I can admit I don't have a high tolerance right now. I definitely work to, I don't know if a ton of people do this, but this is something I do. And I've tried to help other people do it as I regulate my tolerance. So I know where I want it to stay. And I know if it gets too high, I can definitely feel like, you know, myself being able to tolerate more than 20 milligrams at a time or something. Mm -hmm. I work to then weigh myself down back to like doing five or 10 at a time. Um, so I really try to stay within that five, 10 range. One, it's a little more cost efficient. And two, I just enjoy that high a little bit more when I'm really in that spot. So I definitely like know, I think, I know myself and my system to really know like how I can kind of regulate it. So it's super interesting. I mean, everyone kind of has their threshold, but there's definitely times in college, like I was in college during COVID mm -hmm. where there was nothing going on. Obviously all I had to do was smoke weed and I made brownies for like my whole floor. Like I knew how to make edibles on my own. So I did it. And I had like a little ring of a business, which is neither here or there. I, don't, I mean, yeah, but, um, which was super fun, but uh -huh. you know, those brownies were like 75 milligrams a piece. And I was eating like maybe one and a half of those in a sitting. And like, I had the best time ever with my roommate just in our apartment, like fucking around and having like, you know, brownies and whatnot and getting high like all the time. But I was like, at some point I was like, you know, this isn't really a sustainable, high. like it's, it's, it's a good high, but it wasn't like a sustainable amount of milligrams to be taking all the time. Like I would be spending so much money. Mm -hmm. I would be going through so many products where I actually really want to enjoy the product and whatnot. So I don't know being, I think having a high tolerance at some point isn't necessarily sustainable for the amount of product you're going through so I definitely try to keep my tolerance around like five to ten um again so like one of our fully big products for me would be perfect but I mean some of these bud tenders like who you know do this for a living and sell this product like their tolerance is obviously going to be higher they're trying a lot they're sampling all the time so um there's definitely products that we want to make higher for those people but then we also understand that we want to expand the cannabis industry to involve more people who are maybe older and are scared to try cannabis. So I think microdosing would be good to them. So there's definitely spectrums to it. And we definitely within our product line want to hopefully cover more, you know, types of dosages and stuff. Cause we only really have the one right now. So it's pretty linear, but we definitely want to, you know, include all age groups, all generations and all types of cannabis users. For sure. And like, uh, do you have any, plans like near plans that you guys are working on or anything like you yeah. guys are in the near future yeah 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 so in addition to our chocolates and our baked goods we are um launching a gummy line which okay. i know we're going into such a saturated market everyone has gummies um but it is something that we wanted to include because they are vegan so we really wanted to make sure everyone you know it was included inclusive. <laughs> yeah everyone's included like we didn't want to be presenting these products to people who are dairy free or gluten free or whatever so mm -hmm. you know yeah. we definitely just want to include people um and all of our products are individually wrapped so i think that definitely separates us apart too and we're social equity on top of it so i know people like to support those businesses mm -hmm. so um that's definitely something we definitely want to expand you know our beverage collection as I mentioned before and we definitely we were I was talking with my team earlier today and I think something we really want to dive into is including more um cannabinoids whether it's CBN or you know more CBD or CBG and I helped Coda last year launch a project a uh, launch a product with THCV which hasn't really been brought to the Illinois market yet so I think that would be super cool to incorporate yeah um, it, it really hasn't um I actually was talking to another cannabis company that uh they're based in Michigan and they they actually other than them just growing uh just 
THC cannabis, they also been doing all these other different alternative cannabinoids. And actually, like, it, it's just interesting because, like, I, I feel like with I feel like even within just other states that cannabis is legal, I feel like it should still be something that one should be taught or learned because, like, it could help the consumer on how they shop. Because yeah, it, it really like, can. And it's like, you know, last night I'm with um, I'm out to dinner and I'm with, you know, my boyfriend's parents and his parents are in their mid 60s. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're just talking about how they can't sleep. And it's like, you know, I'm thinking like they're not going to walk into a dispensary on their own and they're not going to know what to ask for. So it's like if something's marketing and and advertised as sleep, all they need to see is the word sleep and they're going to buy it. So it's like, but you can't, you know, have that sleep aspect if you don't add the cannabinoids and you know other the other unique molecules that you mm. need to have that product so we can't market our products like that right now we use distilled oil across all of our products so um that's something that fully baked we're definitely gonna try to get into and try to you know really uniquely and target you know those markets of people who want to just have their effects be more targeted rather than just take an edible and see where it goes yeah, especially and and not like exactly like well, what's the beneficial and purpose for actually taking the the gummy or or whatever the cannabinoid the cannabinoid it's in the the product itself. But another cool thing about you guys is that you guys have like the package, but then another package within the package. So like yeah, individually wrapped, yeah. which is pretty cool. Which I yeah, I haven't I, had a chance to actually grab a package and because I actually want to do a review for you guys and all, but like I haven't had the chance to go and get it. But yeah, uh, definitely sure. we have so many things out there. I'm like I love them all. I'm trying them all. It was super fun. Um, but yeah, the individually wrap is super key. I hate buying gummies or chocolates, especially when it's hot out. And it's like they all just form into one, and you're like you have no idea how much you're taking. Like I'm the type of person, cannabis user, who like I actually like to know how much I'm taking because I really like to know how I feel on that certain amount. Like I like to know how I feel on ten versus five versus fifteen or whatever. That's just personal preference of mine. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the individually wrapped, and we also have resealed tabs as well. So it's like if you ever seen like a Tate's cookies container or something, it's like. Uh, you just like kind of reseal the tab and roll it in, like push it in and then you kind of just roll it. So the bag also stays safe as well. And, you know, easy to sit on your counter. So the big thing with our packaging too, is we really want to design something that, you know, people felt comfortable leaving it on their counter because it's pretty and, you know, it's inviting and it's really eye catching. So we mm -hmm. really, you know, design that because we really want people to start talking about their cannabis use and, you know, having conversations and, you know, feeling okay to just leave it out on the counter and not hiding it in their cabinet or whatever and not talking about it. So we really wanted to create something that people would feel comfortable just, you know, leaving on their counter and being like, yeah, like, I don't care if I leave it out. It's pretty, it's, it's going to stay safe with that individually wrapped and the resealed tabs. And, you know, we just hope that our packaging, hopefully just, even if it starts one conversation, mm -hmm. that's all that matters. Just really starting having conversation in the industry is huge. It's so huge for growth and for brands and just for the overall use and, you know, killing the stigma of cannabis in general. So although you're working in an edible company or yourself, like as a consumer, you're more into edibles or? Yeah, I, so... I used to work as a bud tender for years in a medical dispensary and I smoked a lot then because I was just getting into it and edibles, like I said, weren't legal in Pennsylvania. So I could never really get my hands on edibles unless I was making them myself, which mm -hmm. I ended up doing in college. And that was kind of my first personal experience with edibles. Um, so yeah, so I smoked pretty much until the last like two years, I would say I would smoke more consistently and then, and I would smoke in college, like a ton, like all my friends, we would just pass around the bong and whatnot. And it was, it got so bad during COVID, obviously, when no one had anything to do but smoke, we were just high all the time. I mean, it was like the best time of my life. Like, like don't get me wrong, but we were going through eights and ounces and so much crap. Oh, and, hell yeah. Um, oh my God. Yeah, we were going through, oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> like such crazy stuff. And my freshman year, all my friends dabbed and whatnot. And it was just so... Like, it was just so college, and I loved it, and I loved talking about it. I was in, in I started in the industry when I was in high school, like, bud tending, like I said, and then mm -hmm. once COVID hit, and I went home, and then I, you know, I was promoted to uh, shift lead, which I believe is agent in charge in 
Illinois. So I was promoted to that role in COVID. And, you know, I really just worked in the dispensaries and I loved working in the dispensaries. It was probably some of the best years of my life. Um, you, you prefer to work with like person interactions and kind of being where you're at or? Um, I think it's not right. anymore. I mean, I have a pretty, I have a pretty like person facing role. Like I definitely work with a lot of people every day. I mean, I am in my apartment now and I work remote when I'm in Denver, but when I'm in Chicago, I'm out all the time. I'm talking to people and I do love that. Like I have no problem talking to people and I love talking to people about cannabis and everyone who's in the community. So, um, but yeah, so then like my senior year of college, I was getting horrible migraines, like light was super sensitive to me. So, and I know a girl, um, uh, the year before me in my sorority I was in, she had kind of the same problem. She was a big smoker too. And so she stopped smoking and like, just, she just stopped like, you know, doing like the physical smoking. She still did edibles and whatnot, but she stopped physically smoking. And she said it took her headaches away. And then I started to do some research where it depends on some people and you know, your current lifestyle, obviously I'm in college. My current lifestyle isn't that great. So, um, you know, I was just smoking, a ton i was getting a ton of headaches and whatnot so then i stopped smoking um and i switched to edibles and it was just so much it was just so much better for me um so that's when i kind of made the shift and then i got the internship i had last summer um at coda and then i really learned about edibles and i was like oh this shit is so cool um and there's just a lot more creativity with edibles than i think there is with bud and flower and whatnot so mm -hmm. i think i'm a super creative person i like having my ideas kind of come to life. And I feel like you could really see that with edibles more than you can with bud or vapes and whatnot and cartridges. So is it, is it just, is it because like you're making, like you're making like food or like you're creating some yeah. food. That's why you think it's like the yeah, creative part of it. I, I think so. And you have more creativity with the packaging, I think. Um, and the what, different what, kinds what, of products. Why you say that though? Like, like, like what, what what's like the difference between the packages an edible in a package that's like a uh, flower like well because i think flower packages are pretty they're smaller mm -hmm. than edible packages so you have more room to put art and something a bit more eye-catching um i mean the the packaging in pennsylvania flower was pretty boring i would say and like what would be like the like i guess the just the it would just what? be like high supply or Cresco, like the same shit we have in Illinois, but it's oh. just like, you know, nothing crazy, nothing fun. And it's like, you know, you've seen our packaging. It's so fun. It's so unique. Like I, it's I love very all the different colors. Yeah. It's super colorful. And like, we have so many different colors and it's like, you know, there's just so many different things. So, um, and you can, like I said, you can get more creative with the products. Like, I think there's a lot of creativity in naming your strains and you know, the genetics with that is super cool. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't know. I just think there's also more creative, I think, with the um, with the marketing and the advertising, too, because it really ties in. Sometimes it ties in beauty. It ties in cosmetics. It ties in food. It ties in diet. Like it just ties in so many things that, you know, contribute to just more creative marketing and advertising and getting in more consumers. Mm -hmm. um, like, I think, you know, if you're going to put a 75 year old woman on cannabis for the first time she's going to try edibles maybe over trying a joint um <laughs> i mean unless she's like a cool like og colorado right, grandma, but og yeah, granny yeah, yeah. right there <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, if it's like, but if it's like a woman from like i don't know rural illinois or like rural pennsylvania or even like new jersey like whatever like it's just you know people are naturally going to go towards edibles first I think yeah. of that age group. Yeah, it's just it's just very uh, discreet as well. Like it's just yeah, low key, it you know. Like it could just be passed as just yep. a normal chocolate bar, or whatever. So yep, yep. Uh, it, and that's why we also have the individually wrapped too, because it's discreet. Like you could just hand it out, be like, "Yo, try this," and it's preserved in someone's pocket. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's for that too. Uh, so then, like, what's like one? I guess one cool or one interesting thing that that you learn that, that I guess no one knows a lot about edibles. Hmm. That's really interesting. Um, I would definitely say that's hard actually. Um, I'm trying to think of stuff. Like I feel like other people don't know. I don't know. Um, I don't know. Nothing really comes to mind. I, I guess I would just say like with, 
you know, the different kinds of oils, mm -hmm. I think you can't really take someone else's experience and expect it to be your own. Like, especially with distillate oil, like I could take one of our chocolates, for example, or I could take one of Incredibles chocolates and say we both use distillate oil. Like that product could totally affect you differently than like our product did, even though it's like maybe the same ingredients or whatever. But I definitely think cannabis is such a more personal experience than people think because everyone has a different endocannabinoid system. Everyone has different tolerances and like you mm -hmm. and I could smoke together and we could have a great time. But at the end of the day, like we could have two completely different highs. We could be thinking and seeing like completely different things and whatnot, but like, I don't know. I think that's an important takeaway because a lot of people. It, know, it really is, and and yeah. I don't understand why. I guess they tend to think it's every it's the same for everybody, or yeah, like, like it's the same like thing like with it's... alcohol too. It's just yeah, <laughs> like you know, I don't drink, I don't really drink vodka because it makes me feel like shit. But mm -hmm. my best friend next to me could down a fifth of vodka and have the best night of her life. But it's like, you know, I prefer beer over liquor, but it's like, you know, some people prefer liquor over beer. And it's like, mm, it's the shit. same thing. Like, it's all alcohol, but it's I like, you I prefer cannabis know, over different. alcohol. <laughs> well, I do too. I yeah, hands do. down. But, yeah, ha oh, hands down. Yeah, no. <laughs> uh, I literally, I whenever I go out to drink or like have a beer, I always think, when can I go home and smoke? Right. Like, but, yeah. Or, like, I, like, or I, just think of like hitting the pen or, you know, let me just go outside and get anything. a smoke real quick, you know, because. Yeah, I crave, I crave weed when I drink. I do. So it's just like, I just want to like relax. Like alcohol just makes me feel like shit. And cannabis makes me feel so elevated and so good. Right. <laughs> no, yeah. Yeah, totally. And then I just, another thing that's speaking on about alcohol is just another thing that I kind of don't like is that we have to, I guess people have to compare cannabis to alcohol. Like they have to, it, they it, have to yeah. be kind of like linear, but at the same time, mm -hmm. it's like, it's two different We're things. so though. different. Yeah. It's really interesting. You bring that up because from a marketing and advertising perspective, like I, I sometimes use our cannabis marketing off of and take inspiration from old alcohol advertising because, you know, there was prohibition, there was stigma around alcohol, just like there's stigma around cannabis now. And it's super interesting because it's really frustrating because everyone knows how bad alcohol is for you and everyone knows how many lives it takes and how it's addictive. Mm -hmm. and you know like it's so crazy because it's such common knowledge but no one really wants to do anything about it no one really talks about it and then people are so convinced mm -hmm. and the government even convinces people i have no problem saying that the government convinces people that cannabis is addictive and cannabis but kills people and can't like it's so frustrating because they're so different they're but why so, you think so why you think they don't talk about it why why do you don't think they don't talk about it why do you don't I think, think people because talk it makes so much money I think it makes a I think the tax for the government, I think it makes a lot of money. I think it's a huge culture that even if you take it away, it would cause so much more. It, it, honestly, it's going to sound such a bad comparison, but it's like, you know, Mexico can't take the cartel away from like, like they can't take the drugs away from the cartel. Like they're having such problems and backlash because the cartel, like, runs mexico or runs you know other countries in south america like mm -hmm. whatever and i think it's the same thing i mean like it's the culture of like football too it's ridiculous how the nfl just runs things but i think it's, it's the same thing <laughs> it's so oh it's written yeah, oh my we're, God. we're gonna get if, there right now we'll get there yeah but, yeah yeah, yeah <laughs> that's a good segue it's a good segue if the ravens and the 49ers go do you know that color theory yes i yes Super i heard yes, about that color theory yes, yes. i I saw that. Um, you heard there was, was apparently like, like a different color that it was supposed to be the Cowboys and the Kansas uh -huh. City Chiefs as well. Yeah. Yeah. And and now it's on um, purple and red, which is the Ravens and the 49ers, which would be a great Super Bowl. Don't get me wrong. I really um, want the Detroit Lions to, to win. I want the Lions too. I was going to say that. I want the Lions. <laughs> um, you know, they're an underdog. Um like you could see right here, I have an Eagles thing. I'm a huge Philadelphia Eagles fan. Trash, and, you know, no plain. Yeah. <laughs> it's because I'm a Cowboys Everyone fan. That's such a, oh, geez, I should have never agreed to yeah. this. Um, but no, like everyone has such a strong opinion about the Philadelphia Eagles, which honestly fuels me to be even more of a fan, even though I couldn't be more of a fan if I tried. Uh -huh. But, you know, the Detroit Lions, they're underdogs. Like I love a good underdog, and they were so 
fucking trash for so long that yeah, it's like they were. I love that they beat Matthew Stafford and the LA Rams. Um, I do have a strong opinion about the AFC too. I could not. I would be so pissed if I see the Chiefs win. First of all, I'll be mad as hell too. I really don't like yeah, Kansas at all. <laughs> I I don't like the Chiefs. Obviously, you know they beat us in Super Bowl, whatnot. I think yeah. Patrick Mahomes is a huge pussy. Yes, I he's think... a crybaby. Fuck the Mahomes. He is a crybaby. I do love the, <laughs> yeah, the Mahomes. Yeah, I, 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 he's really talented. Don't get me wrong. Like he's a really great football player, but I think he just whines. And oh my he god, did. he sounds like Kermit the Frog. His voice really annoys me too. He, uh, he. I feel like he really showed his true colors when he really bitched about the play with uh, Andy Reid. Yep. Rem- you, yep. you remember that play I'm talking yep. about? Yep. Where, yep. And I love Tony? Andy Reid too. What? Yeah. Um. Where he, where I don't his, remember where his foot was over the the. Yeah, line. I definitely know exactly the play you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, and I was like, and he always in his interviews are like, I don't want a ref call to determine the game, but then he triggers the ref call to determine the game. It's like, dude, like, what are you? <laughs> it's just the way he was like, getting mad, and he just yeah, showed his, it was like you're a baby, bro. <laughs> yeah, I know. And don't get me wrong, they are a great franchise. I love Big Red. Andy Reid's a really great coach. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a ton of respect for him. I think. Travis Kelsey is definitely a Hall of Famer tight end. Um, I'm really, I'm not hating on Taylor Swift. I think she's an incredible woman. And I think that she's done a lot for the music industry and women all over the world. Mm -hmm. But I'm so sick of her being shown over the plays or over, or over like the replays or even over Jason Kelsey the other night. I was like, I couldn't care less about Taylor Swift there. Like, She's or even music. before, so even before they sport. break into a commercial break, they'd be just showing a little snippet of her. Yeah, I'm like, I, don't want to see her I know, and it's like the whole NFL has like, and I, I, you know, I did see this article about how you know Taylor Swift has really brought a lot of women to the NFL, which I think is great. Mm-hmm. Um, she has really done a lot of monumental things this season for the NFL, and you know, for women getting involved and whatnot. And her jacket was incredible, made by um. I forget his last name, but I think his name's Kyle and her name begins with a J from the San Francisco 49ers who made Taylor Swift's jacket. But it's just so frustrating. Like, I'd rather see the replay of the flag that was just thrown than Taylor Swift. Like, I'm watching a game. I'm not here to, like, I don't know. It's frustrating sometimes. It is. Uh, like, I, I understand, like, it's cool and all, but, like, it's culture and all, like, good for uh, marketing, especially for her and the NFL. But, like, yeah, it's kind of getting to a point where it's like, all right, we we get it, you know, like yeah, like we we get it. it, we know they're together, but right. like you know, if they break up, that's all hell breaks loose. Like they can't break up now, it seems, because everyone's so invested in them. Bro, imagine if she, if she were to break up before the Super Bowl. Ah! <laughs> I know. I had a, I had a dream actually. You can't that make the Eagles played the Chiefs. <laughs> well, you know, she's from she's from like the Philadelphia area. And she grew up going to Eagles games and whatnot. And I had a dream that she, the Eagles played the Chiefs in the Super Bowl again. And, um, you know, she would break up with Travis right before. And then she would switch to the Eagles side. And the Eagles would win. And it was this whole thing. Obviously, it wasn't real. But no, I think, cool. with, I think with your team's situation, it's just the coaches, man. That like. Okay, that do whole... you think it's Sirianni or do you think it's the other coaches? <sighs> From an outside it... perspective feel like it, it's like the it's the first guy i don't know i'm not really deep into who is who oh, okay, but okay. i think it's the okay. first guy who's who, who is the, okay who. so nick sirianni's our head coach and then we have obviously we had problems with our coordinators offensive and defensive pretty much all season it was the defensive i say it's the defensive and yes, the head um, coach yes yeah so i i think we definitely had problems with our offensive coordinator and our defensive coordinator more so our defensive coordinator towards the end of the season and our yes. f- offensive coordinator was just the play calling was so shitty. Um, I personally love Nick Sirianni. I think he's ride or die Philadelphia. I think he is the perfect representation of a head coach for the Philadelphia Eagles. And, you know, there's all these players internally coming out and supporting him being like, we don't want to see him fired. He's a great coach. He's not the problem, blah, blah, blah. So they've already made some movements, but I'm curious to see, you know, more in the off season after the Super Bowl, what happened. So mm-hmm. We'll see. I mean, it's not like we didn't. I mean, we barely made the playoffs, and you know, the last, the last seven games were really brutal. Even if you know, like we almost lost to the Commanders twice, even though we came out with a win. You, almost, um, you, you lost. Know, we did, did lose to the Jets. Did you lose to the Giants once? No. Did you? Oh uh, yeah, but to me, like I don't think that we were already in the playoffs at that point. Like yeah, uh-huh. we, we did. We did lose. Like that okay, is okay. a loss on our record. But um, 
you guys know, were there already though, on the playoffs wild card. Yeah, we were but, already there. Like we thing, usually. My, my question is like how you guys lose to the Buccaneers with uh, Baker Mayfield. Well, like? that that's what I'm saying. Yeah, that's like embarrassing. Like we <laughs> definitely had we had a winning record, but we had a losing season for sure. It was so pathetic and it was so horrible to watch. It was really brutal. It's such a monopoly. A monopoly. It's insane. Do you really think it's really script though? Like, do you think it's is is it rigged? You think it's it rigged? I think that I don't really know the right term for it. I think mm -hmm. there's something internally. Like, you know, I think that people are getting, this is my theory. I think the NFL is so big. It owns the day of the week during, you know, 75% of the year. Mm -hmm. It's huge. It's a multi-billion dollar monopoly. Um, it's all around the world. I mean, yeah, it's in the United States, but it's all around the world. Um, people make their teams their life like they're super fans um like some people can't live without the philadelphia eagles or the miami dolphins or you know whatever and i think people are realizing how big it is and people are like you know we don't really have as much information mm -hmm. and i think the movie concussion about cte really spiked a lot of questions for the nfl i think a lot of people were like you know this is, is that a, is that the this, movie with will smith will smith yep it, what, about what, what, CTE and all these players killing themselves because they have CTE and you know it's not diagnosable until you're dead because you have to you know really um you have to look into the brain a certain way to the point where you can't do when a person's alive so um and so, like what does he I haven't seen it uh so what, what oh, does he play like what's what's the role that he plays so he he plays a doctor who he plays the doctor who discovers CTE and creates the name CTE and like brings it to fruition and you know says to the NFL, well, so what happened was backtrack. A lot of these NFL players were going mentally insane, like kind of like that after they were retired um, and they killed themselves because they were hearing voices in their head. They were having like a lot of mental problems. They were beating their wives. They were doing all this stuff. Mm -hmm. So he started to do some research and found a connection and found out that all of these players, because they were getting hit in the head so much and all these concussions over and over again, it turned into what is now CTE um, and started to trigger a lot of, you know, violent uh, episodes in people. And, you know, we really saw it kind of come to light, I think, a little bit more recently with Aaron Hernandez and him, you know. Oh, yeah, with his whole situation. Oh, my God. So, yeah. Like, what, what do you what do you think on that? I, I mean. I think he had to, I think he was mentally ill and I think that he took the fame of being a football player and I mean he literally killed someone before then going to go play for the Patriots in a game like if you haven't seen the documentary on Netflix you have to watch it it's insane I seen it it's just been a it's just been a fat minutes but I'm trying I remember yeah. like, is it where he went to the club or is that yeah he went that... to the club and then he did a drive-by and shot these two people and was involved in some gangs and i don't even know if he was involved in gangs but i don't remember that detail but when he was at the university of florida um and it was he got a very into a lot of trouble. problematic kid to begin with actually very 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 so it's like you know um i think he was angry already i think his dad maybe hit him and then i think he um, you know, Aaron, there's, you know, that his dad, you know, like sexually abused him and that Aaron was gay and then wanted to play football and be more hyper masculine to hide that he was gay and all he, of this stuff. I mean, there's rumors, he, but that was never really confirmed. Um, yeah, he also apparently had a relationship, you know, with the quarterback. With the man. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. that was crazy. I'm like, oh, God. But yeah, there's like, a lot. There's a lot there. I, but uh, I don't know. I kind of, I, it's not like I'm trying to understand why he did all this, but I kind of see like, of course, him being a NFL and just a bulk ass dude, you know, like that yeah. plays football doesn't, I guess, want to be known openly that he's into, you know, guys and all, which I guess right nowadays is like, I think more NFLs who are gay are kind of now, I think openly or whatever, but there's, yeah, no they're a little players, bit more, you know? but yeah. yeah, but there's definitely more closeted gay players. I think in the NFL, I did a project on this like two years ago in college. Um, but there's definitely go? a lot more. Yeah. How did that go? Yeah. 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 It went well. Yeah, I, who I do you think is secretly gay? <laughs> oh, I don't know who's secretly gay. I didn't do that. It was more oh, about like, physical stuff. You yeah, know, I don't, I don't know. I have no idea. I have no idea. Oh. Um, Definitely sound like linebackers or something. Better all people who like aren't really maybe that famous. I have no idea. Um, 
But no, it's interesting with the CTE thing because then the movies, like, you know, then these players start kind of realizing what CTE was and then they started to kill themselves, but kill themselves elsewhere and not in the head. So their head would be preserved to then do research by this Will Smith doctor. I forget his name in real life. Probably, I don't think it was something I could pronounce at the time mm -hmm. um, when I watched it. But so then backtrack the NFL, I think, you know, with these shows coming out, like people were, you know, I think they're trying to, with the hard knocks and the quarterback, I think they're trying to make more shows. So people maybe stop asking questions about what internally goes on with the NFL and start making shows and producing this stuff. So that's kind of my theory. But I mean, I really think cannabis, bringing cannabis back in, because I know we're talking about football. Um, I would love later in life to combine cannabis with the NFL kind of in my career. I would love to do something with that when I'm older. Um, if that's something that does happen in my lifetime, and I know it's becoming a thing in the NBA, I would love to tap into that kind of market with the athletes and using cannabis and stuff. So whatever that may look like, I think that's a huge, huge opportunity to come. I think I I was reading an article. I believe that they the NFL is actually does fund some type of money to cannabis research or something. Yeah, like that. yeah, they do. There was an article I think I reposted on my LinkedIn like maybe two years ago about it. But and I definitely do keep tabs with it. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, they they sent out this article that they are putting money in and time and research into you know uh THC cannabinoid um research and determining whether this is uh you know um a like a performance enhancing drug which we all know it's not if anything it definitely makes me more lazy there's nothing athletic about me when i'm high um so yeah it, it's super interesting like i think they had a lot of pressure to do it um i don't i think it would be super great for athlete recovery i think it'd be super good for you know people with head trauma so and it has a lot of anti-inflammatory properties too that i know every athlete especially in the nfl could use so, but instead, yeah. you know, they're probably using pills. They're probably getting, I don't know. Like, it's like, it's so crazy, but I really think one day it's going to make the biggest difference in athletic recovery. It, it is. And I think that especially with the if cannabis use, especially knowing that it is natural and no type of other chemicals and all. So it's like, yeah, whatever, I guess the, whatever you're rubbing in on, on whatever muscle tension you have, or even if you're like consuming you're still going to end up feeling very well, you know, after all that. Yeah, you're going to feel done. loose. You know, you're whether probably... you play football, basketball, baseball, hockey, you know. It's... Mm -hmm. And it, it sucks because, like, they really are trying to limit, a, a, like, an athlete, like an athletic, athletic person to try to find, like, its uh, way to recover, you know, because, like why are you trying to you know take some pills and all and then it ends up being an addiction because that's how most of these people end up becoming you know or yeah just, you're just in general someone who has a fully access to all these type of drugs and all these type of like amounts of dosage mm -hmm. yep yep it's crazy <laughs> but i definitely think that there's a huge opportunity there that hopefully you know we'll see hopefully in the next decade i think that could definitely be pretty promising of a timeline um but yeah that would be really really cool and i would love to be a part of it somehow so that's something i work on mentally you know how i can kind of get myself into that um definitely don't have as much athletic opportunity in denver um how, i think probably just before would... before we kind of end the, the segue of the end yeah of the NFL, are you how are you feeling with the denver broncos <laughs> you know i don't really follow them because i'm such a diehard eagles fan that i don't oh, okay. <laughs> i don't have that i don't want to put my football energy into any other team um i went to an abs game wednesday night though and like you know i grew up a flyers fan but i, I like hockey was never my thing i'm a huge sixers fan like i would i mean if you're going to ask me about a Denver team, definitely ask me about the Nuggets. So mm -hmm. uh, the Nuggets play the Sixers on Sunday, I think Sunday, or maybe tonight. They play sometime this weekend. But so that's super interesting, especially with the back and forth MVP and, you know, with Denver and, you know, obviously Embiid and whatnot. So uh, the Nuggets are huge. But, yeah, I don't really know too much about the Denver Broncos. There, there's never a team that I put – I do live right by Empower Field, though, so – I do hear some of the games and I could definitely walk there. I'll probably go to a game, but probably if they only play the Eagles. Like I wouldn't go out of my way to put my energy and time towards them. <laughs> and see fucking yeah. Russell Wilson just be trash. Yeah. <laughs> trash and yeah, it's so brutal. I literally couldn't tell you I could tell you maybe two people on their roster. There's a kid from my high school, a kid. He's a man. A man from my high school who's um 
number 60 now, and I think he was, he was for the 49ers, but this is for se- first season with the Broncos, and he plays for the Broncos now. But other than that, I I don't know much about the Broncos at all. Oh, fuck. Well, you know, we'll see. We'll see. If football's almost done, and then we won't have I know. That. Yeah, we'll see if the Super Bowl is, but I'm keeping that theory in the back of my head as the Super Bowl approaches and the championships are played on Sunday. So we'll I'll see. Most, most definitely hit you up if, if, if it's the Ravens and the 49ers. Yeah, if it's the Ravens, right, oh, my God, it's confirmed. It's confirmed. Oh, <laughs> uh, no, that's what's up. I mean, yeah. But other than I, have you, so have you, I'm pretty sure you've been to the Denver uh, airport. Have you? Plenty of times, yeah. Oh, okay, I know because we still gonna be a little topic on Denver stuff, but it's because um, I actually want to talk about the airport. Yeah, have you heard I heard the that there's some. I heard there's one theory about the Bronco that's outside of it that it's cursed or something. I don't really know the theory. Okay, okay, maybe so I'm that's wrong. One, that's one. I heard okay, that. Okay, what are you talking about? The lizard people that you see in murals in the Denver. Or like oh, some I've type, never even noticed that. Or some type of like like reptiles, some shit that's like a bunch of statues or something or paintings all around the Denver. I'll have to look it up. Yeah, you should. Uh, actually, I've well, never seen it. Well, give me one second. And then there's another one where apparently there's like something downstairs at the bottom of the Denver airport. Hmm. Unless it might be the same shit. It's a nice airport. Is it big? It's huge. You have to take a train to each terminal on the baggage claim. It's huge. It's massive. Yeah, okay, just give me one second. Yeah, I'm super interested. Uh... I always tell my co-host something. We w- wish we had somebody that would be behind the behind the camera so i mean the camera the computer so they could like help us out with the links and all like you know yeah you know, just you, quickly you know, yeah <laughs> you know what i'm talking about like joe rogan he's seen joe rogan podcast yeah i have oh, okay yeah. you know how he has he has his, his the jamie guy you know mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, he's just, like, yeah just get, get the shake get the link yeah oh my go. god i've never seen that um oh there you go there's like one right here I've never noticed that in my life. No, um, What's like the theory about them? They're like, so they're apparently it's like a bunch, a bunch, like a bunch of like. I would murals, notice that if I murals saw that. Are, and there's a bunch of like lizards and, or like just a bunch of like kind of like hidden messages and stuff. And a whole and there's a theory of like there's some some shit going downstairs at the Denver airport as well. Hmm. I will have to look at that next time I'm there. I'm flying back to Chicago in like probably like 10 days i think it is so i'll definitely look uh-huh on oh, a forbes too illuminati headquarters yeah headquarters lizard people liars and underground tunnels of some believe are reserved the world's elite in the event of an apocalypse there you go i mean it's pretty rural east colorado i wouldn't really be surprised that some of those theories are out but but that's, that's crazy. crazy yeah i've never heard of that that is crazy um but yeah, I, I don't know. I'm surprised you, you haven't really noticed that. But I've been no, actually well, wanting to. I've been actually wanting to fly over there to Colorado or just in Denver in general because, like, um, I actually want to. I I like to go and explore a lot of uh, cannabis. So I, re- I usually yeah like a lot to, of cannabis here. Yes, <laughs> I usually like to uh go to was it Michigan? So I've gone to like a mm-hmm. few spots already and just. That there's some content and just try out some some bud and stuff. So, I like to just explore over there and especially with them theories out there. Just really mm-hmm. look 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 up for that shit. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Yeah, there's a lot out here. But yeah, if you ever get a chance to come out here, let me know. It's it's I love it here. It's dope. So, um, and I love going back and forth to Chicago too. I mean, obviously my business is there, so I'm back and forth in there a lot. And it's really Illinois market right now is you know, it's really fun having the business there right now so i hope it kind of stays that way for at least a little bit so how how is that so far though like being in in the industry here in, in illinois like how is that it's it's really great so far i mean it's definitely competitive i think you really have to approach it the right way i think you know the way we approach it is we're all about the community we really try to get out and meet as many people what and we do a ton, we go to a ton of non 
cannabis events. I mean, like I said, kind of in the beginning, we're social equity. So we do a ton of charity events. We have our own nonprofit called the Victims of the War on Drugs Project that works to help expunge records of people who have been wrongfully convicted of cannabis and are in jail or, you know, have a, a record with cannabis and, you know, who want to work in the industry because you can't really work in the industry if you have it on your record. So, you know, we work towards that and just working with the community and, you know, I think word of mouth is super old school approach to advertising and marketing, but it really works. So, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you just have to bring something to the market that's exciting and new. And I mean, our brand is exciting. It's new and it's like products that no one's seen before. Our brownie mix has been flying off the shelves. Um, so, and they're insanely good. They're honestly, they're, they're really good. I'm not even just saying that. Um, the second I ate, I was like, whoa, this is like my grandmother's brownies and my grandmother's no longer with us. So it really, you know, brought me back to a really good time. So that was really happy and nostalgic. And um, yeah, but I love the Chicago community. Everyone's super cool. Everyone in the Midwest is so nice. Um, you know, coming from Philadelphia where everyone's a fucking asshole, but I kind of love it in a way because I'm totally like that sometimes. <laughs> but I the Midwest, like everyone's we, super nice. I feel like we have an attitude here too. I'm not gonna lie, but <laughs> you guys have an attitude, but you have an edge. But it's like fine. Like it, I like it. Um, no, I get you, but I think that's more of like yeah. a West Coast thing, though. With Probably, your, yeah. Your attitude, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, no, like I really like the Illinois market, and you know, there's you know, you have the city of Chicago, and you have a lot of states around you where people can come in and buy and whatnot. So, and then you deal with rural. Illinois you're going down by Missouri you're going over by Iowa like you have places from Indiana and up by Wisconsin like you're surrounded by so many states where people can come in and buy your product and whatnot so it's a really interesting market I really like it so far working in it and the people are just really great so I have two questions what are you smoking yeah. anything today I'm not I definitely will tonight I'm just I have to drive like three hours to Aspen after this so I'm definitely not one to consume and drive, so definitely want to play that safe. But once I hit Aspen, absolutely, and well, see the X Caves, yeah. What you smoking today? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I definitely want to check out a dispensary once I'm there. I'll probably get, uh, I'll probably get, to, I'll probably get a pre roll, or I could just get some. I do have some flour that I got at a Rocky Mountain High dispensary not that long ago. Um. Mm -hmm. I have to see if we can even smoke at the guest games. I'm not even sure the rules there, but um, if not, I'll probably have an edible. I got some uh, fully baked stuff, obviously. So I'll probably pop one of those um, and just enjoy myself. I think the X games are going to be crazy watching people flip in the air while I'm high. It's going to be a movie. I'm sure as fuck. Yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah. Do yeah, you like to definitely. do like stuff like that though? Like yourself, like snowboarding or skiing or something? Like yeah. That? Yeah. I'm a huge skier. Um, I've been skiing. That's how I really got familiar with Colorado too. I grew up kind of skiing here and I, I've been skiing since I was five. I was really, really lucky to have my parents kind of shove me in ski school while they go drink in the lodge, which is no problem at all. I'll probably end up doing that. Uh, but yeah, no, I ski. I love it. It's a great way for me to get outdoors. It's really great exercise. And, you know, you meet such cool people who do that. And, um, you know, I have a lot of friends who do snowboard and I've been skiing since I was like five, like I said. So I think I'm probably going to want to pick up snowboarding at some point just to be able to like say I could do both and learn something new. Like mm -hmm. just, you know, add something else to my resume. Why not? I'm a little bit of an overachiever. So I would go out if I way to learn how to snowboard. Um, but yeah. So yeah, love skiing. I love all, I do appreciate skiing and snowboarding events. So I do appreciate the sport of snowboarding. I think honestly, it's crazy, but I think it is similar to cannabis in some ways, how it was, had a huge stigma around it and it was a new sport and was seen as only stoners and you know like people who rocked beanies and people who were so laid back mm -hmm. and you know the skiers were like the rich white people who were so pretentious and you know whatnot and there's still there still are only like ski only mountains in utah which is crazy there's five i think still in the country and three of them i think are in utah mm -hmm. um so but super interesting like snowboarding is really up and coming and it's grew crazy in the last decade especially with snowboarders like kevin pierce and sean white and you know yeah, well, um sean yeah white. so all those guys kind of bringing snowboarding to life and jake burton building the burton brand and building those snowboarders and getting the name out so um there's definitely a lot of really cool history with snowboarding that i think uh really should be shared more widely so it's a really cool sport that i really appreciate even though i don't do it mm -hmm. i think it's super cool yeah um i remember i used to have my phase in skateboarding and stuff so mm -hmm. 
Uh, yeah. I didn't out of that, but yeah, it, it was cool though. I mean, shit, just knowing the fact I still have some friends though that that be you know be skateboarding too and all, and you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's just crazy to me, you know, the, knowing the fact that we still we already old as hell and we're like you know they still skateboarding whatever and we're like yeah, you know, just the nostalgic yeah. to me is like damn. it is, it's definitely solid. Yeah, there's a huge skate park by me right here, the Denver skate park, and I just want to go and like smoke and just like watch all the people do cool shit. Everyone there seems so cool. That's the thing of Denver, like everyone's so cool and everyone's super young too, so it's like everyone goes out of their way to like do the hobbies they want and everyone's super active. It's, it's really awesome to see. That's what's up. And yeah. then like, I kind of, I'm kind of going back to like, uh, from the beginning is like, so you, so you originally are from like Philadelphia and all. Mm -hmm. So like, I guess in general, it's, it's not just for cannabis, but in general, like, so if you like, one really does feel like they should like move out or from like their home state to grow mm -hmm. or whatever, it, should they really like do it or or absolutely like, take the risk absolutely. or yeah, a absolutely, it is a risk. Um, I would say that definitely get out of your hometown if you can. I mean, even if you love it or dislove it, like I love Philadelphia. I mm -hmm. would never mind moving back there. It's not a place that I left with bad intentions or anything I love it there I'm like I love my family I love my house like everything about it I love so I don't want to steer people wrong with that um but you're never gonna really grow as a person or in life professionally career whatever if you kind of stay in the same place uh, it's like staying at the same job for like you know decades on time because it's like you know you're not bringing in any new experiences, you're not meeting new people. And maybe you are, but it's just not the same. And a change of scenery, I think, is always really important. And I will say the one piece of advice that I will say is that if you're considering moving to somewhere far away across the country, I will say maybe try it out before going there. Um, like I was super lucky to have a summer in Denver to really like, you know, grasp and decide if I really loved it here or not and if I could move here. And you know, a lot of people don't get that experience, but if you can have it somehow really go. And I went out of my way to make sure that, you know, I went somewhere completely different, like, you know, going to Denver for the summer when all of my friends stayed in college and were having fun and whatever, like was really hard, but you know, that's the hard part. But then once you actually move, everything becomes so much easier. Um, Cause you already have friends here. You already know the lay of the land. Like it's just like 10 less things to figure out and to be anxious about. Mm -hmm. um before you actually do the move so i would definitely say definitely take a leap of faith and and do it if you can even if it's like going to school somewhere else like if you're going to school out of state or going to school in europe or whatever it is like yeah it just it changes you for the better in the long run that you may not be able to see in a few weeks or in the short term but in the long term it's definitely so worth it i think yeah hell yeah i've actually been thinking to dip in dip in here Right. Really? Yeah, low key. Yeah, it's just been on the back of my mind, but yeah, uh, we'll see. We'll see though. Uh, yeah, uh, it's definitely really great. Like I, and you know, you don't have to stay in that place forever just to say you did it, and then you make friends and you just mm -hmm. learn new things and new experiences. Like so, it's it's really awesome. I really can't talk uh, down to that leap of faith at all for moving somewhere else. Oh uh, yeah, that's what's up, my. But mm -hmm. uh, before yep. we actually wrap it up, you know, do you have any questions? you know for me <laughs> i don't think so this was great though I'm gonna, it's okay so say i guess my last question is if if it's the ravens versus the 49ers who are you rooting for oh i gotta say with my boy lamar jackson yeah i'm yeah. a huge lamar jackson fan so like i would i wouldn't mind that i think he deserves it after he finally got his pay cut and me too you know, so he deserves and he gained that mvp so hopefully you know so Yep, yep, I agree. I agree. But I'm we'll, take we'll Lamar see. Lamar Jackson too. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. see. Yeah, we'll see. And uh, there you go, ladies and gentlemen. There was Molly from Fully Bait. And, Thanks, uh, you know. Really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. And other than that, y'all, we won't see you probably to the next podcast episode or vlog. Don't forget to get high. Don't forget to stay warm wherever you guys yep. at. All the you above. Know. Right. Stay. So have a good one, y'all.